Pretty safe to say it's a good time to be a Rutgers fan. Here's what this past school year has been. Football made a bowl game for the first time since 2014. Men's hoops, their highest conference finish since joining the league. Women's soccer made it to the NCAA semis. Baseball, we just mentioned for the last 10 minutes. Men's and women's lacrosse, both in the top 15. Man, it's nice to be rooting for the Scarlet Knights, and nobody knows that more than Pat Hobbs, the athletic director at Rutgers, who's joining us now for today's big interview. Pat, nine ranked teams throughout the academic year, a first in Scarlet Knights history. I know it's not as simple as one thing, because they're all different departments, different players, different coaches, but how do you explain what's going on? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, it's fun. Um, <laughs> and uh, it just wasn't too many years ago where it wasn't all that much fun. Uh, but we're starting to have a lot of fun here uh, at Rutgers, and uh, it starts with leadership. Uh, we've got uh, right now, top to bottom in all our programs, we've got great leadership, and then it's our job to provide that leadership with the resources that they need to be successful. Um, but it's our coaches. Uh, you talk about baseball and what Steve Owens is doing right now, uh, incredible and fun. Uh, so great leadership in our programs. Um, we still feel like there's a lot we need to do in order to position all of our programs for success. But nine ranked programs, first time in school history, that's pretty sweet. You mentioned Steve Owens, the baseball coach. They're off to the best start in program history. You hired him. What did you see in him a few years ago? So uh, when I interviewed Steve, well, you know, you, you go into a coaching search and, uh, you know, you obviously you put together a list. And when I looked at Steve's accomplishments, my, my first thought was, how did this guy not already get hired away? Um, what he did at Bryant College over nine years, I think four times he won over 40 games. So, and then you meet the guy and you realize uh, this guy knows baseball. He knows how to put a staff together. He knows how to put a roster together. And um, he was going to be patient in terms of resources. Um, so we need, now he's putting some pressure on me. <laughs> we need to get some things done, which is good. That's what you want all your coaches doing. But uh, if you go back and you look at his record, uh, he's been a winner from day one. Um, before that, Lemoyne. Um, before that, Cortland. Uh, he's just, you know, in some ways reminded me a little bit of Steve Peichel, uh, taking over a program that was struggling and getting to being a consistent winner of many games. So uh, Steve, uh, you know, we knew that would translate here at Rutgers. Uh, and now to have the longest winning streak in the nation and be doing what we're doing uh, with guys like Todd Frazier and others, others shouting out Rutgers baseball, that's it's pretty good. So, yeah, he, he's a great leader, and uh, he's doing a great job. Owens, Peichel, clearly the trick is just hiring guys named Steve. You do that, <laughs> you're going to have to. I wish it were that easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you think Owens has done it this quickly, though? This is only halfway through his third year. Yeah, it, it's, it's remarkable. Um, one, I think he's great at developing talent, and, and that's, uh, that was true, again, in his previous stops at Bryant and LeMoyne. Uh, he's and he's a great talent spotter. If you look at the transfers that have come on uh, to our program, they're all major contributors right now. So he's taken the talent and he's recruited well as uh, as well. And I think even sort of next year, people point out to another great recruiting class coming in. So um, the guy knows baseball uh, and his staff too. I would credit you know you know Brendan, uh, terrific um, pitching coach, and Kyle's doing a great job in terms of hitting. So, uh, and, and the guys believe, I mean, the, the best part of it is you just see these guys now they're brimming with confidence. You talked about, you know, this weekend against Indiana, three really late game wins. Um, the guys don't panic. They play well, they know they're going to get their hits. Uh, and so it's just fun. It is fun baseball. I want to get some more Rutgers specific stuff in a second, but having you here is a good opportunity. You're a well-connected guy. You're in all sorts of meetings as a big 10 AD. Where are we with NIL? Are we in a good spot? Do we need to make changes? Uh, we're in the wild, wild west. Uh, and um, there, I mean, it's a completely unregulated field right now. The last guidance we got was nine months ago um, after the Supreme Court ruling in Austin. Uh, the NCAA came out with some pretty brief guidance about it shouldn't be university involvement. There shouldn't be pay to, pay to play. Shouldn't be incentive based. Uh, if you Re believe some of the stories we're hearing around the country. I think people are going past those guardrails all the time. Uh, that's not something we're going to do. We're going to continue to monitor it. Uh, where our student athletes can make money off their name, image, and likeness, that's great. That's wonderful. Uh, to the extent that we can educate and do the things that we need to do, we'll continue to do that. 
but somebody has to step in at some point and um, one ask ask you know are some of the things we were hearing true because if they are then it is it is becoming uh, very much merged into the recruiting of student athletes and you combine that with the ability to transfer now with the changes in the transfer portal um, I, I do worry uh, where we're going in, in college athletics right now and I hope at some point we can put some sense to this uh, and to allow the student athletes to continue to do what they can to, to benefit, but also then to preserve what's best about college athletics. And, and I worry about that right now. But Pat, who steps up? Like it, <laughs> someone has to, and otherwise someone like you who's doing things the right way, it's a competitive field. You're going to be stuck behind if someone doesn't step up. And, and I hear from our coaches almost every day uh, of what's going on out there and the need for somebody to step up. Uh, obviously, the NCAA is in a difficult position right now. They're probably sitting back a little bit and saying, uh, we told you so. Um, that's, again, not defending the NCAA, and it's not exonerating them in terms of what, some of what we're hearing, again, whether it's true or not. Um, but they still have to play a role. They're still the NCAA. They are still the enforcement organization for college athletics. Uh, and I would like to see them come up with a little bit more clarification about the early guidance that they gave us at some point, will Congress step in, perhaps? Um, but even there, I, I don't know what they will do. Um, now, that leaves an opportunity for the conference uh, to start looking at things. And we are having those conversations at the conference level of what can we as 14 institutions do together to bring some sense and sensibility to this. Uh, and so uh, we'll continue to work on that. But we don't have anything that's ready for sort of public response at this point. You brought up the transfer portal. When I talk to people and I hear discussion, I hear only two things. It is a fantastic thing for the players. They are finally at an equal position as coaches or administrators <clears throat> when it comes to going where they want to be and not being stuck somewhere. The other thing I hear is everyone is selfish and dumb and it's ruining sports. So wh what is the reality of where the transfer portal is and where it should be in a year or two or three? So what I worry about most with the transfer portal is a, a lot of freshmen making the decision to transfer after a year where uh, they weren't going to play all that much anyway, right? I mean, we're a school that develops talent. So whether you come into our football program or any of our programs, um, you're likely not going to get the playing time that you want as a freshman, unless you're obviously an exceptional talent. And to see the number of freshmen that are entering the transfer portal and even sophomores where maybe if they stayed that one extra year, they'd really see that great opportunity and then they go somewhere else. So I think once we do a longitudinal study about this, I think you'll see that for some people, the transfer portal has been great. It's worked out really, really well for them and it's worked out well for the institutions that they've gone to. I think for a lot of them, you're going to see that the opportunity they had at the institution they left was probably a better opportunity. Um, but we'll only know that in time. Uh, so I, I think we needed to make some changes, but I think at some point you might see, um, particularly with freshmen and sophomore, um, some attempt to provide better guidance to our student athletes uh, about uh, what opportunities may exist out elsewhere. Because everybody's in their ear. Uh, it could be family, it could be AAU coaches, it could be whoever. Uh, and, and you do hear those stories about people trying to shop players even before they're in the portal. Uh, and, you know, I've got a great group of coaches. They all shut that down pretty quickly and say, hey, you, you know, you're not in the portal. Um, but I do worry mostly about freshmen uh, that they'll jump maybe once, twice um, with a waiver and never really get the college athletic experience that they should. Let me get back to your school specifically. Uh, you brought up Steve Peichel earlier, and over the last few years, as that basketball program has grown, the atmosphere for Rutgers Holmes basketball games has become the darling of the Big Ten because it is so loud and so ra uh, raucous and infectious. Um, you guys changed the name this year. I gotta tell you, the Rack <clears throat> was one of the coolest nicknames. I, couldn't we have gone Jimmy John's at the Rack or something to keep it? This is the important issue of the day, Pat. Well, it's Jersey Mike's. It's Jersey Mike's <laughs> Arena, uh, and we, we, we felt we couldn't get a better partner than Jersey Mike's. Uh, so we brand ourselves Jersey. The map of New Jersey is on our basketball court. Um, you know, we even met with the folks from Jersey Mike's some years ago and said, listen, um, in a couple of years, uh, we're really going to be doing something special here at Rutgers in basketball, but all of our programs. 
uh, and we circled back and, and they, they see it. Um, they're a great partner. They're really excited. It's Jersey, Jersey grit, Jersey brand. Uh, so, um, you know, folks call it the rack, um, but I'm more, more and more now I'm here in Jersey Mike's arena. Uh, people are going out to, after the game, they're going to Jersey Mike's and ordering a sub. Um, I got my favorite number seven that I always get. Uh, so uh, they're, they're a great partner. We're really happy with them. And what a year, right? What a year to, to, to rebrand as Jersey Mike's arena, you know, Ron Harper shot against Purdue, bunch of ranked wins in, in there. It is a very, very tough environment. There's a lot of tough environments in the Big Ten, but I'll put ours up against anybody's. Yeah, I apologize for giving the wrong sandwich place. I meant oh, no, Jersey no, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but since we're on that team, uh, what Peichel has done, I mean, there's almost no precedent for the way he's been able to do it. What impresses you most about the men's hoops program right now? You know, it, it's Steve, right? It's it's what he did um, out at Stony Brook in terms of building that and developing talent, developing players. And there's a brand to Steve Peichel basketball. It's hustle basketball. It's rebound the ball. It's share the ball. It's move the ball um, and run up and down the floor. And if you do if you do that, you're going to play basketball for Rutgers University. You're going to play basketball for Steve Peichel. Um, it's a team that uh, they never give up. They never quit. Uh, and so it's been fun. It's been fun. It's been, you know, two great players in Ron Harper and, and Gio uh, sort of changing the program forever. And, um, but you know, I love what he's doing with the talent that he's bringing in and in, in a different world, right? And now a world of name, image, and likeness and transfers and things like that. One sort of interesting thing, at least at this point, um, we're one of the few programs in the country that doesn't have a single player in the transfer portal. That tells you something about Steve Peichel and the way he runs a basketball program. Last thing for you, Pat. Um, women's lacrosse is ranked. Men's lacrosse is ranked. You know, certain sports matter more in different states. Hockey might matter more in Minnesota or Wisconsin than it does in Illinois. Can you explain what the sport of lacrosse means in the state of New Jersey? Yeah, lacrosse in New Jersey is huge. There's a huge youth um, lacrosse uh, presence. Uh, it's in the high school. It's in the private high schools, basically from Long Island down to Maryland, lacrosse is a major, major sport. So there's lots of fan interest in it. Brian Brecht is doing an amazing job right now. You know, last year we get to the final eight, we go to overtime against North Carolina. So we were sort of right there. We feel really good. Our only two losses this year against the number one ranked team and the number three ranked team. Uh, tough, tough win this weekend out at Michigan, but, but we're able to pull out that win. Uh, so what Brian's doing with the men is incredible, and he's, he's been doing that for a good few years here. And then Melissa Lehman, I mean, what can you say about her? She's in her third year. She brings us last year to the NCAA tournament for the first time in 19 years. Uh, both teams are going to this year likely have the most wins, uh, program wins ever. So there's another two great coaches that are doing a great job here at Rutgers University. Pat Hobbs, you always have great insight. I always appreciate getting a chance to hear your thoughts on big and small issues happening in the world of college sports. So thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. Great being with you, Mike. Take care. Rutgers spring football is coming your way this week. On Friday in the evening, 7 Eastern, 6 Central time, you can see the Scarlet Knights as they wrap things up from their spring practices this year. We're going to talk more about that when we bring in Brian Fonseca right now. He writes... And he covers the beat for Rutgers for NJ.com. Uh, Brian, what is Greg Schiano's philosophy on spring games, what their format should be, et cetera? Hey, Mike, first of all, thank you for having me on. It's great to be here with you. Uh, he has not divulged exactly what the format is going to be this Friday yet. He said Saturday. They're still kind of working through what they want to do. Uh, but I imagine it's similar to his philosophy on spring ball in general, which is it's a time for development, a time to see uh, where the team is, and a time for everyone to kind of gel together and, and get to know each other and prepare for uh, a more grueling, obviously, uh, training camp in the summer. There's always focus on every team about the quarterback. Um, we know that Noah Vedral is the guy who started the last couple seasons. We know about Gavin Wimsatt and all the excitement that he brings and the young potential. Is there going to be a competition from what you understand? Yeah, there is. Uh, Greg Schiano has said that Gavin, ha Gavin Wimsatt has to kind of earn the starting position if he is going to take it. And Noah Vedral, this is his last season of college football. He's been the starter for the last two years. He isn't going to just give it away. So uh, I believe that there will be a competition. I think it will be fierce. And it'll be interesting to see uh, where it goes. I think uh, it can go either way. 
What is it the staff likes about Gavin Wimsett? We saw him in a, a few games. He was able to keep his red shirt last year. He did get some action in the games. But everything I hear is that they're very excited about his potential. Sure. I mean, you, you look at him. He's got he's got the body, the prototypical quarterback body. He's big. He's long. Uh, he's got the great arm. He's shown some of that in the games you mentioned he played in last season. So he has all the physical tools. Uh, he's still young, obviously, still should be in high school. I think he's going to his prom in a couple of weeks back in Kentucky. <laughs> so uh, he still has to develop that aspect of the game, the mental side, all that stuff. Obviously, that's natural. But physically, the tools, uh, they're there. And I think uh, anyone who watches it can can see them. Yeah, that's a crazy thing that he's already played in multiple college football games, but his high school prom is coming up in just a little bit. Um, whoever is the quarterback, they're going to need an offensive line to give them as much protection as possible. I know there was something that Shiano wanted to work on. They brought in transfers. They brought in recruits. How much do they feel that area has improved already this year? Well, it's tough to tell now, right? It's still, uh, still going through spring ball. The 13 practices in. Uh, we talked to offensive line coach Augie Hoffman, who's in his first year at the position after coaching running backs for the last two years. Uh, he said they're starting to gel. Guys are starting to find their positions. But again, it's still too early. And I think training camp is really the time where you'll see guys filling in and, and how they'll all gel. But the, si the early signs are uh, encouraging, I'm sure. That wide receiver, Bo Melton, was such a big name. He's off to play on Sundays. Now, how do they feel about the transfers specifically they brought in? Taj Harris, Sean Ryan, those guys at the wide receiver position. Those guys have shown that they can produce in their uh, previous stops. Sean Ryan at West Virginia and Taj Harris at Syracuse. Uh, it's Again, it's still early. Guys are still uh, working in, getting to know their teammates, the quarterback, the offense. Sean Gleason's offense, he's there for the third year. So, uh, But physically, the signs are there. They can. Uh, it's a big, they're big shoes to replace. Bo Melton has led Rutgers in receiving the last three seasons. He's going to probably be picked in the NFL draft this month. So, uh, yeah, again, the early signs are encouraging, but we won't really know much until uh, training camp here in the summer. One of the big storylines around the Scarlet Knights is the new defensive coordinator that they've brought in. What's the most important thing that people need to know about him? Well, he has a track record for success, right? He, he had Minnesota in one of the top has one of the top 10 defenses in the country last season. Um, he's uh, he's young. He's back uh, near his roots, New Jersey native. So and he's working with a, a revamped defensive staff. Essentially, they've replaced every coach on that staff or moved some people around. So uh, that makes take some time to gel. But uh, yeah, I think uh, it's an interesting hire. And uh, I guess we will see. It's still early days, as uh, as we said, for pretty much every every position for now. Right. Last one for you here, Brian. You know, we just had the athletic director at Rutgers on, focused more so on lacrosse and baseball and, and men's basketball. But when it comes to football, how would you describe the momentum that the program has right now and the energy that it has in the state? I, I know there was a jolt when Shiano got rehired, of course, and he's done a nice job bringing in recruits. But how do you describe the overall feeling about him and the program right now? Sure. I think people are optimistic. As you said, the recruiting classes have been very strong since he's come back. They've shown signs of uh, taking steps forward. They won five games last year, which was, uh, again, building off of the three wins they had in 2020, which was a good first season for Greg Schiano. Uh, so first season back, I should say. Uh, so, yeah, people are excited to see uh, the steps they'll take. This season, this fall schedule will be probably the hardest they've played since Schiano's been back. So it might be a step back in terms of results. But as far as the additions they're making to the roster, the gains they're making in recruiting, uh, yeah, everything seems to be on the up and up, and people are excited to uh, see the trajectory that this program is on. Brian Fonseca from NJ.com will be covering Rutgers this week in their spring game. Thanks for giving us some of your time, Brian. Well, if you're not following the great Dick Buckkiss on Twitter, you're doing Twitter wrong. He recently put this out, where do I sign on to be a walk-on for the spring game at Illini Football? Now, I don't know everything about the rule book inside and out. Um, I think he's out of eligibility. Then again, it's not an official game, so I'm not really sure. So we're going to bring in Jeremy Werner of 24-7 Sports. Uh, he covers the Illini. He can't play, right? Well, I think he only played three years because he couldn't play as a freshman, I think, back when he played. But leave it to Dick Buck as the Hall of Famer to be better at Twitter than all of us millennials and Gen Zers and all that. Like, he's joined. He's just way better than all of us. Have, Go have, like, I just started following him not that long ago. He's tweeting about how breakfast needs to be able to be eaten at dinner cereal whenever you want. He talks about how drinking water is delicious. I mean, he's a wonderfully weird follow. 
Well, here's the thing. A couple of years ago, they did a homecoming a video shoot with him where he had to do a take and, and read this great script that Illinois had written. Did it one take. And he said, Hey, I was an actor. So I mean, he's got, he's got the comedy chops. He's got the acting chops. He's, he's pretty good at this thing, Mike. I'm just glad he's not trying to do my job. I know. Probably I mean, better. The last thing I saw, he posted a picture of him with Julia Child. Because of course he did. He's Dick Buckus. Why wouldn't he have a picture of him 40 years ago doing something with Julia Child? Anyway, we could talk about that all day, or I could ask you about the spring game, which is coming up. So we'll probably rotate towards there. What do we know about the format and how the spring game is going to go for Illinois this year? Well, last year, uh, Brett Bielma basically did the one offense against the twos and, and the, going back and forth. So I expect him to do something similar where the backups basically get double the points uh, than the starters. So basically the same kind of script. He wants the starters playing together to build some camaraderie. Uh, he wants the backups together to, to kind of prove themselves and, and getting double the points kind of evens everything out. But uh, I, I think the, the biggest thing about this one is, is probably to see Barry Lonnie's offense, uh, to, to see what he's going to bring. Because Mike, you saw Illinois play last year. The defense under Ryan Walters took a huge step forward. And while they got some talent to replace, they do have talent. Uh, behind those guys who are pretty good and some good returners. Uh, but the offense kept them from going to a bowl game, and that's why Brett Bielma uh, made a change so quickly, uh, firing Tony Peterson and, and hiring Barry Lunny from UTSA. What do we know about Lunny so far? Yeah, he obviously has familiarity with uh, Brett Bielma. Bielma pulled him from the high school ranks, uh, and he served on Bielma's Arkansas staff for five years as a tight ends coach. Kind of was the offensive coordinator and waiting there, but of course, Bielma got fired. He goes to UTSA and has great success uh, putting up big numbers in the running game with Sincere McCormick. Uh, and we saw the passing game, uh, you know, pick Illinois apart last year with Zakari Franklin as a wide receiver, Frank Harris as the quarterback. He's going to run more tempo. He's still going to run a lot of pro style. He calls it um, tempo is what he likes to call it, <laughs> where they're kind of running pro style, double tight ends a lot, kind of the same personnel, but they're going to get the ball out quick. I think you're going to see more screen passes. I think you're going to see more quick hitters. And we know Illinois should be able to run the ball with Chase Brown and Josh McCray, but they got to get that passing attack going. And last year they went to a lot of seven step drops. I don't think you're going to see as much of that. I think you're going to see the ball get out quicker, but I also think you're going to see him mess with tempo. It's not going to be always high octane, go, 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 but they're going to change things up a little bit. So he's just going to put kind of a different kind of spin on this offense. And he obviously comes in with a, a lot of success, which Tony Peterson had not had a lot of success in at the highest levels in recent years. Barry Loney certainly coming in with that. We well, brought up the importance of the quarterback position, and I've been hearing that the staff really likes Tommy DeVito, the Syracuse transfer. Now, obviously, the staff's not going to say we don't like this guy we just brought in off the transfer portal, but what is it specifically they do like about him? I think the one thing you kept hearing from Tony Peterson and the entire staff last year about Brandon Peters was his lack of, of vocal leadership. It just wasn't Brandon. He's kind of a laid back guy, um, you know, big arm, had all the tools, but just didn't take charge at times. And at times struggled with his confidence. That is not an issue with a kid from, uh, he likes to say North New Jersey and Tommy DeVito. He comes in with a lot of swagger, despite, you know, some, some issues at Syracuse, had some injuries that held him back and then was beat out for the job last year by Garrett Schrader, a transfer, who's more of a run first quarterback. So it didn't work out for him at Syracuse, but he comes in with a lot of swagger. Now uh, we haven't been able to see him throw. We haven't been able to see him uh, play very much. His Illinois kind of keeps a, a closed door policy during spring ball. Now we'll see how he performs. He, he had some success at Syracuse, has a lot of tools, is a little bit smaller of a quarterback, but certainly getting him in in the spring was was a focal point for Illinois. They wanted to get a guy in early that could kind of go with everything and learn the system. Uh, but Barry Loney didn't pick Tommy DeVito. Tommy DeVito did not pick Barry Loney. Uh, DeVito had committed when Tony Peterson was the offensive coordinator here. So it will be a really interesting fit uh, and to see what Loney can get out of uh, Tommy DeVito for the one year they're together. Can Art Sikowski still get the job? I think so. Uh, you know, he didn't have a great year last year, did come in and help them win that Nebraska game. Um, Art Sikowski also, though, was playing through a shoulder injury that none of us and none of his teammates knew about last year. Had a, a shoulder injury coming in from 
from Rutgers that uh, he decided to play through and, and grit through. And, and he did win the starting spot back uh, when Brandon Peters struggled, uh, but certainly wasn't very effective as a thrower when he came in. But if he's all healed up at 6'5", he's got a big arm, a lot of experience. And you talk about leadership. He's got that in, in droves. It's just about can he be effective? He has struggled, of course, during his career in the Big Ten, but he has a lot of the intangibles that you like. I think it's going to be a competition. I would give Tommy DeVito uh, the edge here just because of Sikowski's struggles in the past and DeVito being able to participate in spring ball. But I do think they're going to allow it to be a competition entering fall training camp. Speaking of competitions, I know there's multiple running backs they feel good about. If the season started today, who'd get the most carries in the first game? It's Chase Brown. I mean, Chase Brown could have gone pro, in my opinion, and maybe not have been a draft pick, but I think could have been a, one of the, you know, a chance of making an NFL roster. He's explosive. He's big. He's cut up. He's a guy who could be on Men's Health Magazine, but also run for a <laughs> thousand yards last year. He's only one of you know, 12 guys in Illinois history to run for a thousand yards. I don't know if he got talked about like that, Mike, in the big 10, because there were so many other good backs and Illinois wasn't all that effective last year. And this wasn't a team people were paying attention to, but I think he's one of the better backs in the big 10. The good news is you get another guy who's a different kind of running back and Josh McCray, who's kind of this bowling ball yet has some quickness at six, one, 240 pounds uh, is a really good receiver out of the backfield as well. So they feel they have that, you know, two-headed tandem that can work really well and, and you still got to look out for two freshmen coming in as well Aiden Lawfrey kind of the lightning uh, of the recruiting class coming in and then Jordan Anderson out of Joliet Catholic 6'2 225 kind of a thunder kind of back it'll be interesting to see if those guys can find a role as well so it's the position they're deepest at Mike and and certainly the position they feel like man if we could replicate this everywhere else Illinois football is going to be in a good place Overall, when you consider everything, the, the reaction of the fan base, recruiting, results on the field, how's the first 15 or 16 months of Brett Bielema been? Yeah, I think he's done and said the right things. Uh, the way he's approached recruiting, you can never question his effort. You can never question whether he's taking the right approach. You know, signing 12 in-state prospects in his first 18 months, uh, it's a far cry from the infamous time Lovey Smith signed zero in-state prospects in the <laughs> class of 2020. That was just two years ago. And Brett Bielma is now landing a four-star prospect in the class of 2023 in Caden Fagan. So recruiting, he's done the right things. I think he's shown urgency by firing Tony Peterson, who we all saw didn't work in his first year and didn't really give us a lot of reasons to think it was going to work. He didn't stick with that and be stubborn. He changed. He made a change and, and said, hey, we got to get this right early if we want to build some momentum. And then I think he's involved in the community. I think he comes with a lot of credibility from what he did at Wisconsin. And let's be honest, Mike, they went five and seven last year but they were just competitive. They were competitive in almost every game outside of the Wisconsin loss throughout the year. And Illinois fans were happy to see that after getting blown out in so many games during the Lovey Smith and Tim Beckman era. You can see that, you know, defensively, they run a, a modern scheme that keeps quarterbacks guessing, that keeps uh, offense coordinators guessing. There was something to build up upon there. So if they can just have an offense that is, you know, competent going into next year, maybe this can be a surprise team that can make a bowl game and make some noise in the West. I think Brett Bielma has earned um, some of that credibility after year one, where they scored more points than their big 10 opponents this year, even though they went four and five, they had a positive point differential. That's a huge step uh, for Illinois just to be competitive week in and week out. Yeah, it does feel just the overall feel is that the arrow is pointing up right now in Champaign. Jeremy, you're always great. We want to reward you with something to say thanks for your time. And it is the picture <laughs> of Buckus Legend. With Legend. Julia Child. I mean, he looks like he's about to eat that whole thing himself, holding on a stick there. Can you, can you imagine being with Dick Buckus? Just living the life that he's lived. Uh, the coach in, uh, what, what was the NBC show, Mike? Oh, uh, yeah, the, the basketball show where he was the... It was like the, the same by the hang time. <laughs> hang time. That's it. Hey, I was watching that when I was a kid. I think that was my first like interaction with Dick Buckus out of reading uh, outside of him. I think that was the first time I heard him talk was as the coach in hang time. And, what and a legend. The juxtaposition of being on a, a basically a tween Saturday morning TV show with the meanest, hardest hitting dude the NFL's ever seen is an unbelievable. Just a renaissance, man. <laughs> Jeremy Warner. Great, man. Always great articles. You're right. Thanks so much for your time, man. Thanks for having me, Mike.